we have we do have questions from the committee. I'm going to take Representative Kassar first. Go right ahead, please. Thank you, Neil. Um, a question. Are there any other um, advisory boards uh, that the Department of Health works with that have this arrangement um, where the they have sort of oversight um, sort of at this advisory level with the Department of Health? Um, there are not. Uh, I'm thinking of the, the big ones, the Board of Medical Licensure and Discipline, Dentistry, the Health Services Council. Um, the ultimate, uh, the, in, in every case, the the, the final say does lie with um, the director in regards to regula regulations, protocols, discipline. Um, so no, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions uh, from the committee for Mr. Heitinen? Okay, hearing none. Thank you for your testimony, Neil. We're going to move on to our next witness. Hello, Mr. Baginski. This is Chairman Casey from the Health and Human Services Committee. I have the, uh, you before us on House Bill 6282. If you would please go ahead with your testimony. Good evening, Mr. Casey, Mr. Chairman. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. My, my name is Joseph Baginski, and I'm the owner of Professional Ambulance. Professional Ambulance operates 21 ambulances in the Providence and Kent County areas and we are one of the largest private ambulance companies in the state. And I'd just like to very quickly you know, illustrate the difference between private and public ambulance and why that matters in terms of this bill. Uh, the private ambulance services probably affect in excess of 10,000 ambulance transports per month. Uh, you know, we, do not, we do not participate in the 911 network the folks in the 911 network uh, typically get the most high acuity, urgent need patients. It's very difficult work. I have a great deal of respect for them. You know, my service would never be able to carry out their mission. Uh, on, the other, on the other side of that, the private ambulance people get lower acuity emergencies and many frequently non-emergence transports. We discharge people from hospitals. We take them to dialysis, wound care, imaging, you know, and any, any, variety, any variety of necessary medical treatments. My point being, we have a very different mission from the 911 people. We have, we're a parallel network, but we're not competitive. The State Department of Health does not recognize a distinction between the two types of services. Both, all of the services in the state operate under the same set of pre-hospital emergency protocols. So therefore, any regulations promulgated by this board will have a very direct impact on my business and all of the other private services. Right now, the Department of Health, as everybody has said, is the, is the creator and the creator of the regulations that the services function on. They strike a balance. The Department of Health understands the need for a healthy private and a healthy municipal, municipal service to service the citizens. This bill, 6282, if you read it, would effectively end the Department of Health's ability to independently regulate the industry. It would make any regulation they prompt, any regulation that the state wanted to put out, statutorily would require the consent of the board. And that, while that's not necessarily a bad thing, there is like uh, the Ambulance Service Advisory Board, as you've heard many people say, has 25 seats on it. 18 of those seats are held by people with some sort of relationship to municipal fire. And again, that's not a bad thing, but there are three or four stakeholders in the EMS system, and to achieve balance, you need a variety of opinions, you need to obtain consensus, and to do that, you need some sort of equity of representation. If the, if, if the board is dominated by any one segment of the system, whether it's private ambulance, municipal ambulance, or doctors, certainly anything they do is going to be skewed from their life's experience, their perspective. Up until now, the state has done a reasonably good job of trying to maintain balance, trying to be fair, trying to be reasonable. And again, this bill would eliminate the state's role in regulating air ambulance service in Rhode Island, which I don't think would be a good thing. You know, and yet money, money is always an issue. We, we, share the, we share the municipal system's concerns with unfunded mandates. Uh, one, one interesting point is the board wants to take control of fees for, license, for licensing and inspections. 
but all of the municipal services as well as their employees are exempted from those fees statutory. <coughs> the only people that pay those fees are the private. So that's a concern. And again, giving so much control to a group of people who I don't really think understand my business and what it does and how it functions is probably not best for my business. Again, we, we're kind of happy to have the state as a neutral third party or an arbiter. Thank you, Mr. Boginski. Are there any questions uh, for our witness at this time from the committee? Representative Potter, go right ahead, please. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Beginski, for your testimony. I'm just taking a look at the bill, and just uh, I have a couple of clarifying questions for you, if you don't mind. Um, no, one, no part of the, the makeup on the board says two will be from a professional ambulance service. I take that to mean somebody in your field. Um, you're not one of those people on the board, are you? No, sir. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not a member of the board. Uh, I've attended you know, numerous meetings, particularly when there was an issue coming before the board that was of concern to me, but I have never served on the Ambulance Service Advisory Board. No, sir. All right, good. I, I wonder if you can just elaborate, because there seems to be a little bit of uh, indication from the testimony that we've heard so far that there seems to be mixed opinion from the board uh, on this bill. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about your participation in those board meetings uh, and what that's like, and if you have any opinion on the difference of opinion within the board? <coughs> Well, the board appears to be divided uh, pretty much into two camps. There's the municipal fire services that have their concerns and their issues, and then there are the physicians and a couple of uh, state people, or there were a few state people, and the, the physicians and the state people are driven by like clinical quality regardless of cost. The municipal guys have some balance to that, but like, I think there's a healthy dialogue there, but again, there's no balance. At the end of the day, the board is gonna go like, you know, when, when one side of the issue has an overwhelming majority, like there's never gonna be an issue where the minority is gonna carry the day. This is not 55, 45 or 49, 51. This is like 70, 30. So, you know, the board, the board is skewed to a particular perspective. And again, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but I just think the diversity and, like, more representation of more opinions would probably result in a better work product and would probably force compromise on the body as a whole. You know, if you, if you, if you don't have an absolute rock-solid majority, you're probably going to bend in your opinion. If you enjoy that rock-solid majority, well, you're probably not going to bend too much. Thank you, Mr. Boginski. Are there other questions from the committee at this time for our witness? Okay, hearing none. Thank you, sir, for your testimony. We're going to move on to our next witness. <clears throat> Hello, Mr. Potvin. This is Chairman Casey from the Health and Human Services Committee. I have you before us on House Bill 6282. If you would uh, go right ahead with your testimony, please. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, thank you for your leadership, and also thank you for taking the time to uh, listen to all of our testimony on this important uh, legislation. I'd also like to thank Rep. Bayella uh, for her leadership on this. Uh, my name is John Hoffman, and I am a captain and the director of emergency medical services with the East Providence Fire Department. I've been a firefighter and paramedic with the East Providence Fire Department for the past 23 years and have served as the Director of Emergency Medical Services for 17 of those last years. In addition, and maybe more importantly, um, I've been a member of the Rhode Island Ambulance Service Coordinating Advisory Board for the past 10 years, and have served as its chairman for the past three. I'm honored to say during my time on the board um, and my time as the chairman, we have developed some of the best protocols for pre-hospital care in the country. We've also increased our educational standard for our EMTs and paramedics in the residents of Rhode Island can be proud and feel safe of the accomplishments of our EMS agencies. Today, I am speaking in support of House Bill 6282. In an effort to save your time, I am also speaking on behalf of the other two Ambulance Service Advisory Board officers, Vice Chairman Mike DeMello, 
Chief of the Bristol Fire Department, and Board Secretary Raymond Medeiros. I'm not speaking on behalf of the whole board, um, and I do know that one of the representatives had asked about the consensus of the board, and I would say that about 18 of the 25 members support this bill. Since I've been a member of this board, any changes proposed to the protocols or rules and regulations of how we deliver emergency medical services to the citizens and visitors of Rhode Island have always come before the board for vetting and approval. So I've also heard some of the representatives and some of the other testimony uh, concerned with taking away the duties of the director. I want to be very clear. We're not looking to take away the duties of the director. It does not take away the power from the director. We're looking to do what we have done since 1973. The ambulance board has been in place since 1973. Uh, Rhode Island General Law 23-4.1-2 establishes the Ambulance Service Advisory Board for a reason, so that we can have a multidisciplinary committee and board to help guide our care. However, uh, as I stated that pretty much every protocol and regulation has come before our board for vetting and approval, that changed this January when changes were made to protocols without the board's knowledge. I, as the board chairperson, did not find out until my fire department received an email from the Department of Health along with all the other pre-hospital providers as to what the changes were. I'm here to tell you tonight um, that the present system of having the board's insight and professional opinion has worked. I've seen firsthand the good work of this board. I've been in the committee meetings vetting the issues and how dedicated these board members are, doctors, nurses, city and town representation, fire chiefs, emergency medical technicians, both paid and volunteer, private ambulance representatives, hospital representatives, and members of the public. As I stated, the Ambulance Board is a multidisciplinary team with representatives from the emergency services field and medicine who serve on the board to make a difference. And their opinion should matter, and that's what this legislation will do. In closing, I want to tell you about a call I received this weekend, um, and some of these doctors uh, may have been some of the ones that testified tonight or maybe provided written testimony. Um, and uh, I was one of the representatives who had stated, you know, that there was um, a lot of testimony. And I think an email had circulated that basically created some hysteria um, and made um, doctors, hospital-based folks, and maybe members of the community feel like they were, um, their care was going to be jeopardized. That correspondent said, if this legislation passed, it may jeopardize the protocols governing the transport of heart and stroke patients. That is simply not true. For the record, it was this board that approved those heart and stroke protocols when presented to us by the director of the health department. This legislation in no way puts those two protocols in jeopardy. Um, my dear friend Ryan McTaggart, Dr. McTaggart, um, he spoke of the stroke protocol specifically. Um, and I will say that that specific protocol was vetted and approved by this board. Um, and present it to the director of the health department. There are other hospital systems in the Hospital of Association of Rhode Island that spoke out against that protocol, and it was this very board that helped to push and facilitate and negotiate that protocol, a protocol that I hold near and dear to my heart. As we sit here tonight, the only person who can propose and implement emergency service protocols in the state is the director of health. This legislation does not change that. This legislation does not grant the Ambulance Service Advisory Board the power to propose or implement any future protocol changes, nor change any existing protocol presently in place. Mm -hmm. Only the Director of the Health Department has that power now, and that does not change if this legislation passes. This legislation simply codifies in law the practice that we've been following since 1973, and maybe more importantly, a practice that has worked. Um, I know, uh, just to answer some of the questions that I heard come up, uh, Rep. Geraldo uh, had mentioned um, minorities on the board, um, and when Governor Raimondo was here, uh, her and I worked uh, to try and increase the minorities 
um, that were on the board. So 23-4.1-2 dictates the makeup of the board. And at the time, uh, we were able to increase, so we increased the the membership to include four females on the board. Um, However, um, we were looking specifically for minorities, and unfortunately at the time the governor's office could not find a minority that would fit the the statute um, uh, in in the vacancies that were present. But that is something as a board um, that we are consistently looking to do. Um, There was a representative that said, um, she was worried about the, uh, the, uh, the line that's subject to the approval of the board um, and basically the veto power. Um, if we look at 23-4.1-3, duties of the director, um, the director of health, referred to as the director, shall have full authority to implement the provisions of this chapter and shall be guided by the purposes and intent of this chapter. Um, the other thing that that... that, that um, General law states that the director shall cooperate with hospitals, furnishers of ambulance services, local governments, police departments, fire departments, emergency units, first aid groups, or any other group that furnish or work with groups that furnish emergency medical services. And it is directly that part of the duty of the director that we're looking for this legislation um, to protect. Um, this bill does exactly what we want. Um, we, um, we have never outright shot down a protocol or regulation that the health department has proposed. I know Mayor Policina mentioned the wording um, of the vehicle, um, the name ambulance versus um, rescue. Uh, and the consensus was, and we were able to come to an agreement, that you could either call your vehicle an ambulance or a rescue. Um, so we're not looking for veto power. Uh, Representative Kazar, um, she mentioned the removal of the Department of Health from uh, from the ambulance board. Um, for the longest time, there was no representation of the health department on the ambulance board. So when the former chief of EMS um, was in office at the Department of Health, they never served on the ambulance board itself. They always sat with the ambulance board and worked in conjunction with um, however, it was felt that um, the, the health department shouldn't be proposing protocols to the board, but then voting on those same protocols when then they have the actual regulatory authority to put the protocols in place. Um, and then um, Representative Morgan had mentioned, you know, what is broken. And as the chairman of the board, I can say that I feel that the collaboration between the board in the health department is broken because they have always come to us for vetting and approval. We have always worked together and it is our feeling that the, um, that the health department no longer wants, you know, what is basically stated um, in 23-4.1-3, section B, or 23-4.1-2, which establishes the ambulance board itself. Um, some of the other things that I heard that I just wanted to discuss um, is um, the breakup and breakdown of the board. So the board is comprised of four doctors, um, a representative from the Emergency Nurses Association, two members of the public, two members that are appointed by the House of Representatives, two appointed by the Senate, three appointed by the Rhode Island State Association of Firefighters, two that represent commercial services, six that represent county level EMS, two volunteer representatives in the Hospital Association of Rhode Island. Somebody stated that there were um, 18 members that somehow represent the fire departments. There are 13 members of the board that have any, any either current or any affiliation with the fire department. Um, and then there are seven members that belong to a union. And there's only three that represent the union. Um, and then, in closing, uh, again, some, some of these doctors are, are near and dear close friends, um, and it seems like in their, um, in their testimony where they're, uh, you know, opposing this legislation, um, you know, they're, they're looking for exactly the same thing that we're looking for. Uh, and I'll quote Dr. Linda Brown, 
uh, a colleague of mine who I respect, and uh, I am her uh, vice chair of the EMSC committee. I believe that it would compromise the ability to quickly implement evidence-based guidelines into practice. This would ultimately lead to a decrease in the quality of care delivered to our patients. We must remain up to date with our science, educa uh, educational methods, policies, and protocols. That is exactly what the Rhode Island Department of Health and the um, Rhode Island Ambulance Service Advisory Board have done collaboratively for years. Uh, Dr. Williams stated, we need both the Center for EMS at the Department of Health and the advisory group um, to collaborate, not compete. Again, that is what this legislation has you know, basically done for us, is given us or trying to give us a seat back at the table. Uh, and I'll close with Dr. Alexander Scott. Again, I, I'm appreciative of her leadership through this pandemic and all that she has done. Um, the current board structure, which is advisory, has served the state of Rhode Island and the citizens very well over the past many years as a forum where RIDO can discuss prospective actions and gain feedback from the community before it makes decisions. Uh, I could not agree more. That is exactly what we're looking to do. However, that is something that has ceased to happen. So I would like to thank the committee. I'd like to thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and I'll entertain any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, are there any questions for the witness? Uh, first, we'll go uh, Representative Geraldo, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. President, I, or, or yeah, Mr. President of the uh, of the board, I want to start by thanking you for your service and and not only on on the board but in your other capacities as well. Um, in your remarks, you, something that that really caught my attention and, and just didn't really sit with me well. Uh, not to get off topic, but I think it is important to address is that you had mentioned you and the governor's office could not find a person of color that fits the role for that board. I'd say two things in response to that. One, either we, we really need to look harder uh, next time as there's several people in Central Falls and several people in Providence and many other places um, that, that, that absolutely could serve in whatever opening there was at the time. And then two, I also think that statement is indicative of the larger structural issues that we have on many of our boards and in our fire departments and police departments across the state in that we aren't doing enough to get people of color involved in those fields. And so I know I'm taking it off on a tangent here, but I think those points were important to address and, and, and just wanted to say that if in the future you, th there's difficulty finding people of color to serve on these boards, ask myself or ask a person of color that's, in, that's involved uh, at the state level, and, and I'm sure they'd be happy to find someone and, and make sure that there's adequate representation on that board. Um, so that's one thing. So that was more of a more of a statement. Um, and then second, can you talk about it, one of the things that I feel is, is is happening with this legislation is that there would be more power given to the to the board. And so when I think about that, I think about um, wanting to make sure that the board has the best interest of the communities that they're serving. Can you talk about any specific protocol, initiative, or policy change that the advisory committee has, has championed that's been specific to the needs of people of color or urban communities in particular, like just one specific issue that has happened under your, your, your tenure um, that, that you can say has been uh, championed to support the, one of those groups? So I think one of the um, one of the biggest things that we've done is we've uh, in Rhode Island we have five levels of EMS providers, um, and I think as an as an ambulance board, uh, so so I am a, a paramedic, um, and many of our fire based services operate at the EMT cardiac level, um, and we've uh, in, you know we've increased um, and tried to you know we've we've added an EMR level which is a lower level, um, it's a little bit easier to get into the class, uh, you know we've tried to reach out as individual entities to make sure that, um, th that there's equity and the ability for people to find classes and find affordable classes, um, you know, to, to go in and be able to um, make sure that they can, they can get the education that they need, um, you know, through ride-alongs in, 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 individual, um, in individual departments um, or uh, facilitate the assistance uh, to, uh, you know, education, um, you know, through some of our uh, members, um, you know, on the committee, uh, uh, on the board. 
And then we've also we've also worked with um, entities like uh, the Rhode Island Parent Network to make sure uh, you know, and this is not just just for minorities, but also to make sure that we um, we have patient-centered care. Um, you know, that's kind of the new buzzword now is patient-centered care. And you know, one of the things that the ambulance board has is it has two members of the public um, and a multidisciplinary approach. So it gives us the ability, um, you know, to try and reach those those other populations. Okay, thank you, John. Are there any further questions? Uh, okay, we have a few. Uh, John, if you'll hold on with us. Uh, first, we're going to go to Representative Potter, then Representative Speakman. Thank you, Chairman Casey, and uh, thank you, Chair, as well, for uh, your testimony and uh, your service. First, I would echo uh, my colleague, Representative Geraldo's comments, um, and, uh, you know, just understanding in, within the framing that there is a major racial equity disparity in healthcare outcomes for communities of color. I would strongly encourage you to make that a priority for the board uh, to have representation from those communities on it going forward, especially considering that we now have a new governor. Um, secondly, you know, there seems to be a little bit of dispute in terms of the intention of the bill and the language in the bill. And I go back to the, the same point that I brought up earlier um, to a previous witness, where again, I'm looking at multiple segments of the bill that say, subject to the approval of the board. Um, so one, my question is, how do you think, uh, in the event that there's a dispute between the Department of Health Director and the board, that dispute would be resolved and an ultimate decision would be made? And two, if it is not the intent of the legislation to take that oversight regulatory uh, authority away from the Department of Health and move it towards the board, ultimately, what is the point of the legislation? So I think what we're looking for is open discussion that we've had since 1973. So when you look at the front page of the statewide protocols, for example, uh, it says these protocols are established by the Center for Emergency Medical Services Medical Director of the of Rhode Island Department of Health and the Rhode Island Ambulance Service Coordinating Advisory Board. So basically, there are three entities that um, have, I don't want to say approval power, but have the ability to weigh in and say. So the, there is the physician medical consultant, there is the director of the health department, and there is the ambulance board. And all we're looking for is for the 25 members of that board and the people that they represent to have a voice. So we're just looking for open discussion. And like I said, I, I can't think of a time, and I know some of the doctors have mentioned intubation, um, there's been talk about the stroke protocol. In every one of those cases, we were able to come to a resolution. There's never been that I know of in my time on the board anything that the director of the health department has put forward um, or any other entity that has been completely shot down by the board um, and, and, never, and never made it into a protocol or into a regulation. There's been a lot of collaboration, and I'll tell you, um, and, and I'm preaching to the choir because as our representatives, um, you as our lawmakers do this every day, long hours, committee meetings, subject matter experts, testimony, um, looking to other states, uh, to go into this, but then we find a, a product that is um, that the ambulance board can be proud of, that the Department of Health can be proud of, and our citizens can feel safe with. And uh, again, our protocols are second to none right now. I, I think our track record as the Department of Health and as the ambulance board speaks for itself. Thank you. Um, we do have uh, questions from other witnesses. Uh, I do just want to quickly represent uh, Representative McLaughlin, if you would. Go ahead, Representative McLaughlin, go ahead with your question. Uh, yes. In, uh, in reference to, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the bill itself, uh, I'm, I'm looking and I'm saying, you know, if something's already, uh, you know, uh, basically, and all the protocols are in place, 
uh, you know, and the Department of Health, uh, you know, wants to have more of a say on this. And I'm, I'm saying, uh, I think you should leave well enough alone. Okay. But, you know, unless you've been in the back of an ambulance, okay, suffering from a heart attack and having, uh, when, uh, Rep. Geraldo, uh, you know, basically mentioned uh, minorities. Yeah, that, that's great. I had a woman working on me, okay? And that young lady saved my life. You know, so something's, uh, you know, the, the board can, you know, offer evaluations uh, critical to protocol, you know, but uh, as far as playing more of an important role, uh, I think our EMTs do one hell of a job. So, with that said, you know, basically, uh, I'll, leave, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Representative McLaughlin. I appreciate your comment. Um, okay. I'm going to move to Representative Speakman. I believe you had a question. Uh, yes, Chairman. Thank you very much, and thanks to the EMTs who kept Representative McLaughlin in the we are appreciative of that. Um, my question uh, sort of follows up on the same thing that, that uh, Representative Potter was talking about, which, which is if you look at um, Section 23.4.1-4, uh, uh, it talks about the, the things that, so it says, subject to the approval of the board, that's new language, the director shall establish minimum standards to be met in the following areas, and then it lists nine areas. And so as I read that, and again, I'm not a lawyer, but as I read that, that would mean that the director cannot establish minimum standards in any of those areas without the approval of the board. And so if, if as is the case from, um, I asked a prior question, the board meets quarterly, to me that seems like the director is being, a, a significant amount of decision-making power is being removed from the director if she cannot make decisions in these areas without the board's approval. So can you help me understand uh, how that works? I know, I know you said that the, the director has ultimate authority, but provisions like this seem to contradict that. So I appreciate clarification on that. Thank you. Rep, thank you very much. Through the chair, I, so as it stands today, or as it stood prior to January, the ambulance board has always weighed in on that. And we meet at, Basically, so we meet quarterly, whether we need to or not, and we meet as needed. Um, so the, the meat and potatoes of our work, the lion's share for our work, is done by the committees. And when it pertains to items like um, regulatory stuff and protocols, we meet and then we provide that to the health department. So before the new regulations came out, the Department of Health sent them to us. They were vetted through us. They went through the public hearing process. And if something came about that was an emergency, and I'll, I'll use the protocol that was uh, released in January for the pandemic um, for immunization, we could have had an emergency meeting just to get some eyes on that protocol, and it was a protocol that was released and then needed to be amend uh, amended. But had we gotten the, uh, the weigh-in of all of our 25 members, because that's a protocol, and the protocol basically needed to be changed to say that EMTs could provide vaccination. The directive was to vaccinate as quickly and as efficiently as possible, and we could have, you know, at, at the onset, the ambulance board could have said to uh, chief of EMS at the center of EMS, we think that EMTs that are licensed to provide IM injections should be able to do this. Now, in most of the larger communities, that is not an issue. However, for many of the private services that they predominantly have EMTs, and for many of the volunteer services, they need those EMTs. Providence, East Providence, Cranston, you know, they're, they're almost all of their personnel are cardiacs, and they could administer vaccines. Um, but in those other communities, they really needed that. And, and luckily, the governor ended up changing that, or I, somebody weighed in, um, because, again, that was never sent forth through the ambulance board. So to your, uh, to your point, Representative, um, we, while we meet quarterly and established, um, 
we have worked with the health department to come up with a design unless there is some kind of groundbreaking evidence-based change that needs to be done clinically protocols get released once a year unless there is need and that's what happened with the um, immunization protocol uh, but other than that we, we don't stand in the way of progress we would meet as needed and as often and frequently to get the job done and that's what we have done since 1973 Thank you. Thank you, Representative Speakman. Um, are there any other questions from the committee at this time? Okay, Representative Bia, go right ahead, please. I just have one question for you, Laura. How do you define the word open discussion? So uh, basically the, the open discussion that we have had you know, again, since my involvement on the board for 10, almost 11 years has been in a public forum at a public meeting that is posted that uh, the representatives from the health department are there. Uh, everybody has a chance to speak. Uh, same thing with the committee me uh, meetings. Um, they're open and subject to the open meeting laws. Uh, and we vet the issues. And, you know, uh, many of the doctors that have um, provided testimony, um, they have been. You know, so yes, there's, there's four doctors on the board, but there are doctors that need to be represented that aren't on the board that do come and they speak, um, as well as other rep representatives from other entities and other organizations. We've had people from the Rhode Island Parent Network. We've had people from the Special Needs Coalition. We've had, um, so the, the open dialogue happens in, in, in public, in a public meeting. Um, uh, again, we try to get the lion's share of the work done in the committee meetings, um, and then for approval by the full board, which then presents it to the health department. I hope that answered your question, Representative. Yeah, so we're, so basically at the end, the final decision has been made by the Rhode Island Department of Health. Correct. And recommendation of the board. Correct. So that is the system that is currently in place? Up until January, that was the system that was in place. So what is the system that is in place now? It is, it is the feeling um, in the opinion of the health department that they no longer need the opinion of the health department. That's our correction of the Ambulance Service Advisory Board. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question uh, and your answer. Uh, representative, are there any other representatives with questions? Uh, representative Morgan, I, you just reappeared on my screen. Are, are, do you have a question? Okay. So we're going to go for, to Representative Potter, and then we're going to have Representative Kassar. Thank you, Chairman. Just a follow-up question, and I appreciate your testimony again, Chair. So I know we're looking in hindsight, and you made a comment uh, to my earlier question that said that there's never been a situation where the advisory board uh, and the director uh, have been unable to, to reach a mutual decision. But again, my question is, um, you know, and I want to be optimistic that there would be that, that type of uh, uniformity in any type of public health policy, but I think we can all agree um, that unfortunately public health policy has been something that has been politicized recently. and. I would just say uh, broadly to the, my fellow members of the committee, I think any time that we're um, addressing public health policy and the oversight capacity of the, of the director, that's something that we should be very, very careful in doing. So I just have to be um, you know, somewhat pessimistic and, and pose that what if. So in the event that there is a, a major disagreement between uh, the advisory board and the director, how do you, in your capacity, how do you envision that there would be a resolution from that disagreement? So again, I, I think, you, again, and I, I'm going based on history representative, but since 1973, we've been able to come to a resolution. Uh, you know, I, I, I've heard some of the, the people mention special interest. Um, to, to me, EMS is not a special interest. It is my interest. I, as a paramedic it is, and a firefighter, it is my profession. Uh, I, I'd like to think in some regard I am an expert. Uh, that, that does not mean I'm a doctor. doesn't mean I can make a decision without a doctor. However, um, as Representative McLaughlin said, 
in the back of an ambulance or a rescue, I'm very proficient. And I think that the collaboratively, we can work together to solve these. Um, and, you know, I, I look at some of the challenges that we've had with licensing. So, um, you know, some of the big issues that we've had at the ambulance board um, was, uh, you know, airways. Um, and we came to a resolution, a resolution that I think uh, is saving lives. Uh, we, we, as the ambulance board, there was a very publicized change to the cardiac arrest protocol. Um, and it was through the efforts of the Rhode Island Ambulance Service Advisory Board, uh, the Rhode Island State Association of Firefighters, and also the Rhode Island Fire Chiefs Association that helped to provide a public campaign. Um, and again, it was the medical professionals on the board that pushed for that change. Um, and, and, and again, but it took, it took, uh, you know, it, it, it took meetings. Uh, but we came to a resolution in Rhode Island right now uh, is Rhode Islanders have a much better chance of uh, surviving an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest because, because of those efforts. So those discussions, while they're lively at times um, and long, which, I, again, I'm preaching to the choir because um, that's how you conduct um, your position um, in the same fashion, that's how we foster that open discussion um, and we make the system better. Um, and, you know, I can go back, you know, while I haven't been at this as long as Mayor Policina, um, you know, I am 43 and I've been uh, an EMT since I was 18 and a paramedic, um, and the protocols now are so much better. And, again, it's been through effort, leadership, and, you know, professional respect um, but from all entities. And I think the biggest thing that I can say uh, to your representative is 25 eyes, w and then the stakeholders that they represent are much better uh, than, than two sets of eyes or one set of eyes. Um, and everything in healthcare now is multidisciplinary. Um, you know, and again, I don't think anybody would say we shouldn't have doctors involved in this. However, we also need to remember that we also, we have a multidisciplinary disciplinary committee for a reason. Uh, so I hope that answered your question, Representative. Thank you, John. Okay, uh, if there are no other questions from other representatives, I'm gonna have Representative Kassar. Go ahead. All right, um, thank you so much, uh, Chairman, and thanks for sticking with us through all these questions. Um, and, and thank you for your service throughout COVID um, because these have been such unprecedented times. Um, I think that you mentioned that the January situation um, was in regards to vaccines and it was COVID related, is that right? So that, so that was part of it. So there, there were several changes uh, that were made. Um, and again, they were, they were made unbeknownst to me. And again, it's, it's not my job uh, to, to answer for the health department as, as the chairman of the ambulance board. However, when changes are made uh, by virtue of my position, um, I tend to get a lot of phone calls when changes are made. And so I had a lot of EMTs call and say, you know, where did these protocols come from? And I said, I don't know. I just, I just got the email just as you did. Um, so some of them had changed some medications. Um, and when it comes to the fact that, you know, when it comes to the specific protocols, with the exception of the immunization one, um, a lot of them, from a clinical standpoint, they make sense, with the exception of the fact that nobody had a chance to, to, to look at them and vet them and to have any questions for them. Um, and then the, the protocol for the immunizations um, that did come about uh, because of COVID. Um, but I think the biggest thing that, that it lacked was the fact that we had EMTs that were licensed to provide IM injections that weren't allowed to do so in the protocol. And then a revision or amendment came back out in February to allow that to happen. And again, I think for the smaller communities um, and probably for some of the private ambulance companies, that was more important because they tend to have more EMT licensed personnel. So that, that was one of the protocols, but there was, um, there was uh, 10 protocols that were changed at that time. Okay, um, that's helpful. So I, I just wanna remind us that January was a little bit of a mess um, when it came to vaccinations and everyone was still figuring things out. And I, I, would, I would like to think that the Department of Health was managing the immediate rollout um, and in a very uh, fast changing landscape. Um, but when, when we're outside of a pandemic situation, 
Um, when a new protocol is rolled out from the Department of Health, some of it isn't up to the board to have an opinion on. How you implement it in your different departments, yes, but some of it's just clinical protocols. Um, but can you tell me what kind of what's statutorily required for the rollout of a protocol? So typically what happens is the protocol is proposed by an entity. Now it might be, you know, you know, maybe it's you and I, we work for an ambulance service or a fire department and we propose a protocol. Um, and 99% of the time they get submitted um, to the Center for EMS. Every now and again, somebody will get one to one of the members of the ambulance board and ask us to forward them. Uh, the health department compiles them um, and, then, and then the ambulance board meets on them. Now, depending on what it is, so if it's a, if it's a protocol change, a lot of times that goes to the Rules and Regulations Committee, and then it gets vetted through there, um, and that's where we kind of debate, you know, you know, do we like it, don't we like it, is there anything that needs to be changed, should we tweak it, um, you know, in any shape or form, is it something that's attainable, um, and is it going to be good for patients? Um, and then entities have a time to weigh in, and, uh, you know, I'll use Dr. McTaggart um, and his stroke protocol, for example, again, um, since its infancy, before Dr. McTaggart was even in our state, which thank God he is here uh, because he's a, a literal rock star, um, our, our ambulance board had come to, you know, a, a good stroke protocol, a strong stroke protocol, which he made better, and along with the efforts of the Stroke Task Force, which is, you know, got some legislative teeth, which is good. Um, however, there were entities that spoke out against it. There were other hospitals that were afraid of hospital bypass. Rhode Island was one of the first states to have legislated bypass to a comprehensive stroke center. And, but there was entities that spoke out against that, um, and, and, and that got vetted in those committees. And eventually, you know, the ambulance board approved it, and then it went to the Department of Health and the director of the health department in conjunction with their physician medical consultant, then made it protocol. So it sounds and, like and, that, uh, John, if I may interrupt you yeah, for, for just a minute, absolutely. it sounds like that's a little bit of a lengthy process, right? And when we were talking about um, COVID vaccinations in January, unfortunately wouldn't have been ideal for it to go through a committee process and figure it out. That did seem like something that the Department of Health probably needed to kind of manage a little bit more closely than something that would have been your normal process. Is that correct? So I think what could have happened in, in, in that, that case, in the, in the uh, effort of collaboration, is the, the Center for EMS could have sent it to me, said, we're looking to make an, a protocol change um, that we need to do quickly. I could have sent it out to the board. I could have asked them to respond to me, you know, individually so we didn't violate any open meeting laws. And just to say, you know, we're going we're gonna to provide this. We're going to look at it after the pandemic is over. But the health department needs to, um, you know, needs to... Um, you know, get this out because we're in a protocol. And then, I'm sorry, we're in a pandemic. And then I think what we could have done is said to the health department, hey, we think that as the ambulance board, we think that EMTs should be allowed to vaccinate, right. um, which was ultimately the outcome. So it sounds like, um, you know, your explanation has helped me um, understand. So in the title of the section, you're really trying to change this from an advisory board to a coordinating board and hence the rest of the language in the body of the bill that suggests that um, the director shall be subject to the approval of the board. And I, I definitely understand how this can work. And advisory boards are kind of challenging. I serve on one myself. But your example also makes me think that the removal of the director of EMS from, um, this, from his seat on this board may have been, may have sort of led to this situation, right? Because normally if you get a protocol or a recommendation, you would have a working relationship with that person where you could call and have that discussion first and say, yeah, this is time sensitive and maybe now is not the time, but we can vet it. So I, I think there's, there's a little bit of um, just a challenge that, we, that has been built into this. Um, in response to Rep Morgan's excellent question about sort of what's the problem we're trying to solve here um, and what's broken. You mentioned earlier that the collaboration between the Department of Health and the board is broken. And I think it, it just feels like this is a really blunt instrument to try and solve that problem. And it sounds more like what you wanna do is repair that break and figure it out. And maybe this just needs a little more time to figure out what comes next and if legislation is the right solution here. Um, 
But thank you. Thank you for answering my questions. And, and Representative, can I just make two quick, very quick comments on, on, on something that you said? So, so initially, um, you know, as it pertains to that protocol um, and, and the fact to move quickly, I think the change that was then amended to do actually was to speed up the fact that we wanted to increase efficiency and to get shots in arms and vaccinate the population as quickly as possible. And that change affected that. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is um, within the past 10 years, that was when um, the director was added to, or sorry, uh, the chief uh, for the center of EMS was added to uh, the board. So they weren't always there. And we were a coordinating board before. Um, and at the health department, and I, I please don't, I don't want to miss, be misquoted, but I think at the health department's re request, that was legislatively changed before. So basically, we're just looking to have and maintain that relationship that we know that those 25 positions um, to make sure that we continue the great efforts that have, that have been going on since 1973. Thank you. Thank you, John. Okay, are there any further questions uh, for the witness? Okay, thank you, John, for your testimony. We're gonna move on to our next witness. Scott Cattell. Hello, Mr. Cattell. Yes. Yes, sir. This is, uh, I'm going to say, it's, this is Private Casey. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is Chairman <laughs> Casey from, from the Health and Human Services Committee. Uh, and and you, you are the uh, Rhode Island, you are with the Rhode Island Association of Fire Chiefs. Um, I appreciate having you here for your testimony. If you could um, keep it brief and try, try not to uh, delve into some of the uh, issues that have been done, uh, discussed prior. Uh, but if you would please go ahead, and uh, we, I'm sure we'll have some questions for you. Very good, sir. Uh, my name is Scott Cattell. I'm the fire chief of the town of North Kingstown. Uh, 36 years in the fire service, 33 years as the EMT uh, for the, uh, within the state here. Um, essentially, and I will, I'll be very brief with you because I've listened to the testimony of others, and I, I hear uh, what everyone has to say, and I respect what everyone has to say. The facts of the matter, uh, committee members, is um, the Ambulance Service Advisory Board being made up of 25 people is a system of checks and balances. There's a balance there of a number of different interests. Interest from emergency medical field, interest in the fire service, interest from the doctors, um, and other areas. And what has made this beneficial is the ability for all these different interests to be able to come to the table and discuss and debate, discuss and debate changes and improvements in the emergency medical services of Rhode Island. What's going on here is um, there are people um, on the board and perhaps at the Department of Health who have a, view, a vision or where they want to see Rhode Island's emergency medical services go in the future. And as a progressive fire chief here in Rhode Island, I support improvements in our emergency medical services. But I'm not sure I can support the speed or the extent to which some of this takes place. Uh, the old adage, Rome wasn't built in a day. If we can, if we can set a plan and make some of these improvements to make our service delivery better over the course of, of a number of years, I, I think that everyone can win. The reality, committee members, is there's discussion out there. There's discussion to phase out fire department-based emergency medical services in the state of Rhode Island and turn to a different plan based on hospital-based EMS, where ambulance rescues would respond from hospitals into the communities for calls, for emergencies. I'm not sure if any of you are aware, but uh, there are approximately 83 first-run rescue vehicles in the state of Rhode Island right now, 83 ambulance rescues. Sounds like a lot, but the changes that have been made in the last 10 years or so in the fire service or in EMS 
um, have taken us from where we could carry two patients to the hospital with minor injuries to the policies and procedures want us to carry only one patient. So if we're going to look at um, under this legislation, um, and I, su I support this legislation, I wish I didn't have to support it. I wish that we, as the uh, services or the interested parties, could continue to discuss and debate and find middle ground. But unfortunately, um, I think what we found is that some executive authority has been given or executive decisions have been made that are putting us um, at a disadvantage or, or are, are creating orders and, and decisions that are making our job more challenging. I, I don't want to uh, hold all of you up any further than that, but the, the system, the Ambulance Service Advisory Board was designed as a system of checks and balances, and I think it needs to continue to be a system of checks and balances. The reason why this proposed legislation was put in place was to continue that system of checks and balances, and perhaps the, the proposed language and the verbiage that's been put in isn't the best, Perhaps it can be um, amended or sub A, but at the same time, there's a reason why it was done, and it was not done for malicious intent. I thank you for the opportunity to speak, and I will answer any questions. Thank you, Chief. Are, are there any questions for our witness from the committee members? Okay. Hearing and seeing none, uh, we're going to move on to our next witness. Thank you, Chief. Hello, Tom Carroll. This is Chairman Casey from the Health and Human Services Committee. You're here before us on House Bill 6282. If you would please go ahead with your testimony. Uh, good evening, Chairman Casey and members of the committee. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak. I'll be brief and try not to repeat the testimony of others. I am Thomas Carroll. I'm president of Paramedic Systems, Inc., which has been the contractor provider of 911 services to the town of Bristol, Rhode Island for the last 34 years. Paramedic Systems is a parent company of Alert Ambulance Service, which is licensed in Massachusetts and Rhode Island and previously New Hampshire. Alert has been the contractor provider for a number of municipalities in Mass and at one time Tiverton in Rhode Island as well. I, like Mayor Policina, have a few years of experience in emergency medical services. My professional and volunteer career spans over 40 years in three New England states. 34 of those years have been with Paramedic Systems and Alert Ambulance. I'm an EMT cardiac former instructor coordinator, and have served on multiple EMS boards, commissions, committees in both Rhode Island and Massachusetts, including two terms as president of the Rhode Island Private Ambulance Association. For many years, I was a regular attendee and participant at the Ambulance Service Coordinating Advisory Board meetings, and yes, I remember when it was the Ambulance Service Coordinating Board. I stand in opposition of H6282 in its current form. This legislation, as worded, will remove the Department of Health's regulatory authority and oversight of the Department of Emergency Medical <coughs> Services. While there is merit in many of, mayor, of the mayors and others supporting comments, it's been my experience in dealing with multiple departments of health in New England that reporting relationships such as this proposed by this legislation do not exist elsewhere. I can say as a taxpayer and a businessman, I'm certainly not a fan of legislative mandates However, in my professional experience, such requirements as a paid medical director are commonplace in other states and are essential to ensuring service quality. Uh, while I believe there's certainly problems with the current system as presented this evening, I think that overall the Ambulance Service Coordinating Advisory Board in its current form has served the citizens of Rhode Island well and can continue to do so. In my career, I've seen the Advisory Board and Department of Health achieved great things. I, I can say, as stated earlier, Rhode Island has some of the most progressive protocols in the country and has so for many years. Hope, I, I hope that this introduction of this legislation and the ensuing discussion this evening uh, Jim, has brought forth the need for change and improve, and improve communications. There's obviously valid argument, valuable arguments on both sides of, of the 
discussion. Uh, I'd like to again uh, state my opposition and, and thank you, Chairman, and the members of the committee for this opportunity to speak. Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, I appreciate your testimony. Uh, are there any questions for our witness? Okay, Tom, I, I do, uh, do want to concur with you uh, regarding our protocols and, and uh, the standards of care that we do currently, uh, that we do currently provide here in Rhode Island. Um, I think they are top notch. Um, other than that, if there are no other questions from the committee, we're going to move to our next witness. All right, thank you, Tom. Okay. Hello, Mr. Valletta. This is Chairman Casey from the Health and Human Services Committee. You are here before us on House Bill 6282. If you would please go ahead with your testimony. Thank you, Chairman, and uh, good evening, uh, members of the committee. Paul Valletta representing the Rhode Island State Association of Firefighters or is affectionately known by Dr. Warren as the uh, special interest. Um, I usually don't give my resume, but I, I think this is important. So, you know, I know what I'm talking about when it comes to emergency, emergency medical services. I was a firefighter for 35 years. Uh, I've been an emergency medical technician licensed in Rhode Island for my whole career, and I still am to this day. Uh, the firefighters uh, are in favor of 6282. Uh, it's in unfortunate when a good bill with good intent is met with distortions and with rhetoric that people will be harmed if it's passed. This is an insult to the brave sponsors who knew this bill would be controversial, but thought it an important issue to discuss. Let's have a respectful, professional discussion of why this is important instead of disparaging good people. And I apologize to the sponsors for the actions of others. I also apologize to the dedicated members of the ambulance board who were accused by the president of the Rhode Island Emergency Room Physicians in his written testimony of having a long history of reluctance to adopt evidence-based practice standards. I've been attending board meetings for years, and I don't believe I've ever seen him at one, so he should check with whomever is giving him his information. Frankly, I would have expected more than distortions of this legislation and insults from the professional medical community. In my years attending board meetings, I can count on one hand the times the board may have disagreed with a proposal of the health department. The health department and the board have always had a courteous, respectful, professional relationship, and they've always worked things out when they have had disagreements. For those who think this is some kind of power play or there is a nefarious reason behind this legislation, consider three of the groups that support this legislation. The leagues of cities and towns, whose members, the mayors and town managers, appropriate the funds to provide emergency medical services in their cities, towns, and fire districts. The Fire Chiefs Association, whose members manage and run their respective departments, and the firefighters who perform the service. We all have one, ob one objective when it comes to emergency medical services, and that's to provide the best service to our citizens. So why this legislation? In January of this year, the Health Department instituted new protocols regarding emergency medical services. This deviated from what the policy had been in place for years. Before January of 2021, the procedure had been if the Health Department wanted to propose a new pro protocol, or wanted to rescind an existing protocol, they would forward that to the board. That proposed protocol is then assigned to the chairperson. The chairperson assigns it to a subcommittee of the ambulance board for vetting. The subcommittee then votes on the proposal and that recommendation is forwarded to the full board for a vote. Much like the way you guys do things. Until January of this year, the board's vote had always been honored. As with the board, the firefighters have very rarely disagreed with the proposals of the health department. Our main disagreements, probably three in the last five years, come from proposals that had been made, which if instituted would have led to a substantial cost to our fire departments, with no evidence the changes would have substantially improved the quality of care. So if the ambulance board's opinion now carries no weight at all, 
There is zero oversight and accountability of the health department. The Department of Health would be the only department of Rhode Island state government with governing power over a department of a city, town, or fire district. They would have the power to mandate protocols that could cost cities, towns, and fire districts hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars, and no one could do a thing about it. I'm predicting tonight, and I promise I won't say I told you so when it happens, and it won't happen next week, and it might not happen next year, but at some point in the future, your mayor or town manager will be calling you saying the health department just hit me with a mandate that's going to cost me X amount of dollars, and you won't be able to do a thing to stop it. This legislation does not take the powers of the health department away. The health department remains the only one that can propose new protocols and rules and regulations. The health department remains the only entity that can rescind protocols and rules. And the health department remains the only one who can implement new protocols or rules. I would ask the committee members to take a look at Rhode Island General Law 23-4.1-3 B and C under the duties of the director. In closing, I want to address something the Director of Health wrote in her written testimony. In the third paragraph, she wrote, Decisions regarding Rhode Island Emergency Medical Service System should not be sold solely to a single board. First, this legislation does not give sole authority to the board. That authority stays with her. Second, just a reminder, the single board she speaks of is made up of 25 medical professionals. But there is one part I do agree with when she writes, a single board should not be solely making decisions regarding the emergency medical services system, but neither should a single person. Thank you for your time. I knew it was a long night. I'll take any call, any questions that you have. Thank you, Mr. Valletta. Are there any questions for our witness from the committee? Representative Kassar, please. Um, thank you for your testimony um, and for your service. Um, just one thank you, Rep. Just one quick question. Um, statutorily, can the Department of Health put out a policy without this advisory board's approval? A policy or a protocol? Either one I, or I, both. I, 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 mm -hmm. think, I think there's a difference. I don't okay. think presently they can put, she can put out a protocol. Okay. It depends what the policy is. I mean, there are policies, I guess, that govern the, the workers at the health department. That so the board just regarding EMS? Yes, I believe they would have to go to the board. Okay. That, and, and you know what? This, this isn't anything new. That's the way it's always been. No, I, I'm new to this with this bill, so I'm just making sure. Thank you. Yep, I, I got you. Thank you. Are there any other hey, questions? Hey, Ch Chairman, can I give one ex I know it's been a long night. Can I give you one example of, of, a, of one of the times we disagreed with them? Sure. Go right ahead. It, it's, so several years ago, the Department of Health wanted to get out of licensing Rhode Island EMTCs in the state of Rhode Island. And their plan was, and their proposal was, that all the cardiac techs in Rhode Island <clears throat> would become paramedics. Now, we have 2,200 cardiac techs in Rhode Island. So I just did the quick numbers, and I'll be, I'll be happy to share this with the, with the committee of how I came down to these numbers. If that protocol had passed, and they said all the cardiac techs in Rhode Island now, which are most of the fire departments, all the cardiac techs had to become paramedics. I've got the numbers. I'll send it to the committee. Johnston would have, would have had to pay $1.1 million dollars. The city of Cranston, it would have cost them $1.9 million. And the city of Providence, it would have cost them $5.1 million. So that's what I'm talking about, where there has to be some kind of oversight. There has to be some input into, in, into these protocols that are being, I mean, that's not chump change. That's big money. And that would have been put on the cities and towns if there was no oversight to say, hey, if the board wasn't available to say, listen, we can't do this now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if you could hold for one moment, we have another question. Rep Kassar, please. Yeah, thank you so much. Just based on uh, your comment there. So is the issue really that an unfunded mandate? 
Is it really that's that if, if funding came along with that uh, policy that that would be acceptable? Or not, I mean, that it's is, policy by policy, but do you understand what I'm getting at? Is really the core I, the funding? The, that's a big part of this rep. Okay, thank and, you. Uh, yes, that, that's, a, that's a huge part of this, yes. It's quite possible that the other part of that has to do with collective bargaining as a, re, uh, you know, when the state makes it a requirement. However, it's not part of a, a municipality's contract for their uh, service providers to be at the level of paramedic. So I think Well, that's that, a great point. That's, that, a, that's a unbelievable, that's a great point because most of the contracts, well, I, I shouldn't say most because I'm not sure of most, but in Cranston, you have to be a cardiac technician to be on the fire department. So if they had made that change, what does that do now to the, the 196 cardiac techs? You know, they're not, they're not cardiac no more. They would have to go to paramedic school. Um, so, yeah, that's a great point. Okay. Uh, thank you. Are there, are there any other questions from the committee? Representative Potter, go right ahead. Thank you, Chairman. Good evening, Mr. Valletta. How are you, sir? Hi, Rep. How are you? Doing very well. So I just want to ask you the same question that I had asked some other witnesses. Um, there's, there's been a little bit of disagreement in terms of where the ultimate authority to make a decision would be in the event that there's a disagreement between the director of the health department and the advisory board. Um, hypothetically in that situation, how would you envision that a dispute being resolute, uh, coming to a resolution? Um, I have never seen, and, and I know I know you got this answer from uh, from Captain Potvin too, and, and it's not answering your question. But I have never seen the board and the health department get into a disagreement that they couldn't work out when it came to uh, when it came to medicine, when it came to procedures, medical procedures, things like that. Uh, I've never seen that happen. Uh, I wouldn't have a problem as, as it stands right now if. A protocol was put forward by this legislation, and the board didn't think it was a good protocol to go forward. I think then they'd have to work it out. Um, then after that, uh, I would have no problem with this legislation going forward if there was a mechanism for that kind of re uh, that kind of dispute. But I, I just don't see that dispute happening. But that's a very legitimate question. Well, of course, I'm not an attorney, so. Um you know, reading the legislation, I'm, I'm, I'm reading it from a layman's perspective. Um, but I'm just, I'm trying to figure out, I mean, if, if there's the expectation that there's gonna be continued uniformity between the opinion of the advisory board and the director of the health department, um, I'm wondering where the, the urgent need for this legislation comes in. And could I just ask you, Paul, briefly, um, Again, we've heard some disagreement about where the ultimate authority would lie with this with this bill. In your opinion, where do you see this? I mean, in, in the event that there's a, a dispute that cannot be resolved, uh, the advisory board is on one opinion, on one side of the opinion, the directors on the other side. In your opinion, from the intent of the legislation, where does the ultimate authority lie? I think the protocol can't go forward. I think it has to be agreed to. So that's something that we probably, I agree with you, we may have to work out, I don't know, but I, I agree at this point, the, the proposed protocol would not go forward. But I, I could tell you, I've been going to these meetings for years. I've never served on the board. I've been going to these meetings for years. I have never seen the board and the health department not, a, not be able to work something out. And I, and I just wanna tell you why, why now for this, I, I was asked that the other day, why now this legislation, because there is a, a slew of new protocols being introduced probably in the next month, or they may have already gone to the board, they just haven't been vetted yet. So that's the reason for the urgency of this legislation, because if, if that happens and we can't do anything, then all those protocols go into effect without anybody saying it. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there any other questions uh, for Mr. Valletta? Yes, uh, Representative McLaughlin. Oh. Hi, Rep. Uh, Mr. Mr. Valletta, how are you? I'm good, sir. How are you? 
Okay. Uh, you know, I just want to, uh, you know, thank you for your years of service and uh, uh, your, your wisdom. Uh, my main area of concern is uh, when you talk about protocols and mandates in the future, you know, of the rescue service. Uh, actually, some of, some of these mandates could actually uh, uh, basically help or hinder the rescue service. Am I correct? Well, you know... Um I'm going to tell you, I, I, although sometimes I disagree with them, I don't think the health department ever does anything that, to, that would try and hurt us. I think just sometimes they come up with ideas that they, they don't look at the impact that's going to have financially on the rescue service and the departments, and that they have to take that sort of thing into account. I, I don't think, Rep, I wouldn't sit here and, although there's been a lot of bombs lobbed at people over this legislation that wasn't right, I'm not going to take that stand. And I'm not going to sit here and say that the Department of Health would do ever anything that would, would try to hurt us on purpose. But they have to look at some of these things they want to put in service that they do financially cripple us. I see. Uh, my, my main area of concern is the uh, uh, basically the service administrated, uh, uh, administered, you know, by the rescue services. They do a hell of a job. Okay. Uh, the implementation. Please. No, you said you're right. They do a great job. Yeah. The implementation. Especially, especially, the, especially the last year, what they went through. I know it. Uh, the implementation or future implementation of, uh, you know, uh, protocols and mandates, okay, uh, whether they be uh, in the scientific area or uh, to, to actually uh, save, save more lives, uh, how, how would that be filtered, uh, you know, um, when the board meets and, uh, you know, you people being professionals on, you know, cardiac care, stroke care, so on and so forth. Uh, right. So when, when the director, the department has a doctor assigned to them, we have doctors, there are doctors on this ambulance board, and although they might not think I respect them, I respect all the work emergency room physician and emergency room nurses do. I served, I served 10 years on a rescue I've seen the, the work the, that the nurses and doctors do in emergency rooms, and we listen to them. We take their opinion, but they should also take our opinion. So we, okay. we, we have to work together on this thing. Well, I want to thank you for your input. Uh, Paul. Thank you. you. You've always been a straight shooter. You know, and once again, thank you for your service. Thanks, Rep. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Representative McLaughlin. Are there any other questions from the committee? Okay, hearing none, we're going to close the hearing on this Thank bill. you, folks. Thanks for hanging in. Thank, thank you, Mr. Valletta, for your testimony. This will close the hearing on House Bill 6282, and we will move to our final bill of the evening, uh, which is last on our agenda. Uh, that is House Bill 6284 by Representative Morgan regarding uh, health and safety, the licensing of swimming pools. Representative Morgan, if you would please go ahead with your presentation. Yes, thank you, Chairman and Committee. You've all been sitting there for a while, so um, this uh, this bill um, corrects an issue with our law that affects only one category of pool pools. Um, you know, if you're a hotel, you don't need a lifeguard. If you're a gym, a fitness center, you don't need a lifeguard. If you're a public pool, you don't need a lifeguard. If you post certain, uh, a sign, a sign on your, uh, on your fence and you have a fence and you have restricted uh, access. If you're a condominium complex 
and you have 45 or fewer units, you don't need a lifeguard. But if you are a condominium project or community and you have 46 condominium units or better, you have to have a lifeguard. Um, it, it just makes no sense because all those other categories are public pools. A condominium community actually is a restricted pool. It doesn't allow people in from the public. You just can't walk into a condominium uh, swimming pool and, and go for a swim. You have to be an owner there. You, you have to be a homeowner in the condominium community. Um, these condominium communities are very, very careful. They have fences around. They have restricted access. You have to have a a particular key or a swipe card or a code that you have to put in. Um, many of them require the people who use the pool to um, actually uh, uh, do a, a short uh, pamphlet, read a pamphlet on first aid. They have a phone right right beside the pool. So they are and they, they and they post the same rules that a private. Uh, that a public pool has. So this bill um, removes just uh, just that, that if you are a condominium project, you're not required to have a lifeguard. Um, right now, if you're 45 or under, you're not required to have a lifeguard. And this makes it just for all condominium communities. Um, the other part of this legislation says that um, it, it would remove the, uh, the part of the law that says it requires a person trained in first aid to be physically located in close proximity to the pool in question. First of all, that's pretty, in, it, it's not real precise. What is close proximity? In, in my district, we have a condominium uh, community that has a pool. And there are two fire stations within a mile of that swimming pool. Uh, that's, that's close proximity. I mean, those are really good, good firefighters. They would be up. It's a mile away. Seriously, it's a mile away. They would be up in a heartbeat to take care of anybody who fell around the pool. Um, and on, on top of that, everybody who uses the pool must read the booklet, say they've read the booklet and they understand uh, what to do if somebody should cut themselves or fall in the pool. So um, that's what this bill does. Um, it really, it's just, it just makes it more fair, quite frankly. If you're a hotel, a gym, a fitness center, a public pool, a condominium with 40, a condominium community with 45 or less, you don't need a lifeguard. This is the only category in our law, if you're 46 or better and you're a condominium com community, that you, ha you have to have a lifeguard. It just corrects it. Thank questions? You. Thank you, Representative Morgan. Um, are there any questions from the committee? Um, I just, I have a general question. I, I, first, I do want to say that there's written testimony uh, from the Department of Health. Um, they don't say whether they're in favor or against, but they do have amendments proposed. So we'll take a look at that and take that under advisement. I just have a question, because uh, when I was younger in my high school through college days, I was a lifeguard for mm -hmm. the state of Massachusetts, uh, or at the time, you know, we have counties. Um, and this, this legislation, as I'm looking at it, um, on the second page um, that says that uh, you know ni no lifeguard shall be required for any pool license in this chapter provided they're using the term lifeguard do, do you know and you may or may not know this answer and I don't want to hold you to it but is there a state uh, is there a license or a uh, a qualification that you have to have other than a first aid card to be a lifeguard in the state of Rhode Island. Uh, okay, so mm -hmm. I, I, I'm interested in finding out what the, what the uh, requirements are 
because right here, when we're striking uh, item number two on line seven on the second page, it says that we're striking the language that says it would require a, tra a person trained in first aid to be physically located in close proximity. Um, this doesn't state that that person is a lifeguard. Uh, it's, it states that they're trained in first aid. Um, you could be trained in first aid and be unable to swim and still not be able to do anything when there's somebody in trouble in the water. So uh, I'm just wondering, uh, as a general question, uh, you know, what the, what the actual qualification is. And I guess I'm going to be doing a little research tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know the answer to your question. Okay. Um, I, I think there are other, I, I, do they have to have first aid? I think they do, but there also are, are other um, physical um, abilities that they have to have. They, you know, they have to know how to grab somebody appropriately to get them out of the water and, and things like that. Um, but again, I mean, it's really kind of no other category of pool has to have a lifeguard just condominium communities with 46 or better units. Um, and there are, there are many of them across the state uh, to the point that those larger communities can't use their pools. And they all have these rules that, you know, if, if you're a grandparent or uh, you, you have to, ha you, you can't send a child to the pool by yourself. There has to be an adult with you. They have to have a phone on the wall there's all of these things that they've already built into their safety, their safeguards. So it, it just really makes no sense why the law was written to penalize, and it is an expense for them, quite frankly, to penalize them because they are larger than 45 units. Okay, it's a valid point. Are, are there any questions uh, for the bill sponsor from the committee? Okay, if there are no other comments, then I will go ahead and close the hearing on House Bill 6284. Um, and I will second. End go ahead, Representative Morgan. Did I'll you second that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, will close, I will close the hearing, and now I will accept Representative Morgan's proposal uh, and movement for adjournment. And if I have a second, second, Representative Potter and Representative Bia, all in favor can give a voice vote. Aye. Thank yes. you. Thank you very much. This has been the Health and Human Services Committee meeting uh, for this uh, week, the 5th of uh, May. Everybody enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair.